Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English. And we turn now in our study of Virgil's Aeneid to book two, the final hours of Troy. People who do this like me for a living always love to get into these really silly hyperbolic debates about what's the most important stuff ever written. And the truth is, of course, usually somebody wants to say it's the Hamlet to be or not to be speech. We'll, we'll study that one later. But what's fascinating is that before we have the to be or not to be speech, in Act 2 of Hamlet, Act 3, where the to be or not to be speech um, exists, in Act 2, at the very end of Act 2, some actors show up and meet, again, Hamlet. It's, it's fairly clear Hamlet seems to kind of know them. He welcomes them as if he knows them. And then he asks for a recitation of a famous scene, the death of Priam, king of Troy, by... Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles. This is the book in Aeneid II where that information comes from. It's possible this may be some of the most important lines of poetry ever written in terms of its ripple effect. No question about it. Now, let's um, just remind you that if you haven't been watching and following at LearnStrong.net, I certainly recommend that you do that. I've already given full lectures on the Iliad and the Odyssey, and I am assuming that you guys have been following those lectures. Let's turn now to our conversation of Aeneid and kind of where we've been. After an introductory comment, we already messed around with Book 1. Of course, in Book 1 we have the role of Juno being played as the great wrecker of Aeneas' uh, mission and plan. We have uh, Aeneas' mother, Venus, Aphrodite, who's speaking to Ju Jupiter, Zeus, will say, listen, uh, there's, this, there's this help that you've promised. How about it? And Jupiter will say, no question. Um, it's, it's all going to work out the way, I, uh, the way I intend, or the way fate intends might be the better way to say it. We then will have uh, Aeneas to Carthage, where he will meet his mother Venus without realizing it until it's at the very end. And then finally he meets the lovely princess Dido, that Phoenician princess who has herself lost her husband to a, a murder by her brother. And so now she's building this amazing city. In many ways there has been lots said and written about the fact that the Aeneid, far more than the Odyssey and far more than the Iliad, the, the Aeneid, of course, playing games with both of those, with both of those texts, obviously, that the Aeneid is a, a much more political text in that the driving interest is always going to be about Aeneas getting to this place where he will found this amazing city and, of course, this amazing nation, Rome. And uh, Aeneas, uh, or Virgil, obviously, is going to celebrate that all the way through. So there's all this information that's kind of read back into history to make sure that we're ready to celebrate Rome. Now, again, the hope is that you're reading on your own this information and then using me. Of course, our learning theory, we always say it, don't we? Um, just to remind you, that ability to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, and we do that in our annotative approach by asking those three guiding questions. At level one, what does the text say? We're summarizing. At level two, what does the text mean? 2A, messages, themes. 2B, the rhetorical level of reading. Here, we're looking specifically at symbolism and at irony. Uh, we're going to see a whole lot of both of them in this. And Lots and lots of artwork, for example, has been predicated on the study of, of, of this book to of Aeneid. Finally, at level three, we ask, how can I relate to this information in some kind of meaningful way? At 3a, how can I relate to other texts I already know? Now here, we're going to, all the way through our study of the Aeneid, do what we did through our study of the Odyssey. We will ask, what do we know and learn from the Iliad and the Odyssey that helps us read the Aeneid? This is one of the advantages that Virgil had, of course, was that he had the amazing Homeric poems, and so he could build off of those, and not just Homer, but all the other Greek poetry and drama uh, that was affiliated. We, of course, will study quite a bit of that drama. Finally, at 3b, we'll ask, how can I relate to this information to me personally in some kind of personal way? And I hope, if we're doing anything right, and I'm not sure that we are, but if we're doing anything right, I hope that at least I'm challenging you to kind of give some consideration to these texts as it relates to you personally. We'll ask a few questions about that here at the end. Now, as we begin our study of, uh, of Aeneid II, 
Um, I want to go back one more time because I think it's so precious. I mean, some of you smile when I say this again and again. But it's the heart of our AP study, and so let's remind ourselves what I said in the very beginning. In some fundamental way, and I'm helping you to understand the way that this is true through the course of our year together, we are, both individually and collectively, we are the stories that we tell, the stories we accept, the stories we reject. And if that's the case, then book two of Aeneid and book three of Aeneid, because it's one long story, which obviously plays the same game of Odysseus's flashback chapters of 9 through 12 when he was messing around with the Phaeacians, right? Same, same gig going on, huh? We also have the ironies that are going to be really crucial. Here you have Aeneas telling Dido, the queen of Carthage, what it's like to watch a city fall. Okay? Now, of course, Dido is herself going to fall head over heels in love with Aeneas, and for him leaving, she will in fact commit suicide. So there's all kinds of tragedies associated. In the same way that Odysseus was talking to the Phaeacians and supplicating a, a, a trip home, Aeneas is fundamentally asking for help, but ultimately he will leave Dido, and in the process, she, like the Phaeacians, are, it, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause her all kinds of negative energy. But there's another layer to this for the Shrek uh, fans in the house. Let's call it the parfait layers or the onion layers. I think about this. So you got Virgil, who's writing a poem about how a city falls, namely Troy, to a princess named Dido. But many, many years later, the great empire of Rome will destroy Carthage in three important what we call Punic Wars. But wait, I'm not done. I feel like I'm selling Genji knives up here or something. Wait, I'm not done. Consider the fact that any empire from Rome on, once this poem is, is written, any empire that picks up and reads this book, this poem, is in fact messing around in book two with the notion that even the most remarkable of cities, civilizations, falls. And the way that it happens is oftentimes through subterfuge. You don't see it coming. It's clear that Aeneas is going to argue there's no way that we thought Troy could fall, and then it did fall. And at the end, the fall is tragic. What is it like, for example, to be a civilization after the Romans who picks up this poem and begins to read it? Of course, we could ask, what's it like to be an American reader of this poem? from the very beginning years even of America. And of course, as America becomes the great superpower that she now is, what's it like to read a poem where you have a hero telling a story about how a city falls? The ironies, as we say, run deep. Well, let's go quickly now through a brief summary of Aeneid Book 2, and then we'll get into the lines. Um, as we've already said, like Odysseus in Books 9 through 12, we have this, um, we have this uh, you know, telling of a story in Book 2 and in Book 3. However, we're going to point out that Virgil is far more sophisticated than just simply robbing from Homer and especially the Odyssey. No, 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 no. There's way more going on than this. I hope I can show that to you. The story uh, that Aeneas tells in Book 2 and then into Book 3 fundamentally has three parts. Before Troy falls, during Troy's fall, and after Troy falls. So it's kind of an easy schemata for you guys in your notes. Let's go through the major events of Book 2 really quickly. Without question, the big one is the horse. Now, of course, we heard about this hollow horse, especially in the Odyssey, a couple of different times. You'll remember even that Helen gives a bit of a story, as does Menelaus, about that horse and the way Helen, for example, walked by the horse calling to the men in the voice of their wives and all of that. Menelaus as well having some stories about the horse. But here, we're going to find out the real story of the horse. We're going to have the great liar, Sinon, who is going to make us always think about any kind of back and forth, yes and no, when we meet Aquinas in his theology, later when we meet Kierkegaard in his either or, we're always going to be coming, or Hegel and his thesis antithesis, we're always going to be coming back to the great liar, Sinon. We're going to play the game of asking, What's the difference between Odysseus telling a lie, for example, several stories that he tells in the Odyssey, so that he can get what he wants, and Sinon telling the most tragic of all lies, convincing the poor Trojans, who are a bit gullible, we must say, right, a bit gullible, um, to believe 
that the horse is a good luck charm and they should push it into their city, and yet that's exactly what they do. We have the great Neptune's priest, Lycaon, who is going to say, you guys, this is stupid, and for that, his sons will be swallowed up by snakes, and then he will be swallowed up by snakes. Famous artwork here. For uh, Last time I took students to the Vatican, they were able to see this work of art, probably a copy, we believe, but a co a nonetheless, profound sculpture that will show a strong man fighting two snakes. We'll, of course, have Cassandra as well, who will say, this is a bad idea, nobody will listen to her. We have the city destroyed in horrific ways. At one moment, in fact, um, we're going to actually have Venus showing Aeneas the gods themselves destroying the city. Now this one, Ken, takes us back to a prophecy that Neptune helped build, Poseidon, helped build along with Apollo these amazing walls. And the Trojans didn't properly thank Neptune, and for that, he's going to wreak vengeance. Of course, that's the irony as well, is that Neptune, we know about Neptune and Poseidon and his vengeance in terms of what he did to the Phaeacians. In one of the pivotal moments, I referenced it already from Hamlet 2, in one of the pivotal moments, we will in fact see the death of Priam as well. Pyrrhus or Neoptolemus, the son of Achilles, will jack him for that. At line 692, all that's ref referenced of Priam at the end is he is a corpse without a name. It's a compelling line, and I think it speaks volumes to the ideas that we're playing with in terms of the Aeneid as a political text, a political poem. Then we have Aeneas seeing Helen hiding in horror, afraid for both the Trojans as well as the Greeks. He's going to kill her, and then Venus's mother comes and says, no, 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 you can't blame all of this on Helen in Paris. It's the gods that are blamed. And then, of course, we immediately remember this has everything to do with the judgment of Paris. And, of course, who offered Paris Helen? It was the very goddess speaking to her son. It's Venus, right? After this, as we've said, Venus shows Aeneas the gods destroying Troy and reminding him that he has a family that he has to save now. As the city begins to implode, and you have all this horror, and it is, it is very graphic descriptors that we will have. As the horror starts to unfold, Aeneas will try to save his family. His ancient father Anchises, who of course slept with Venus and produced Aeneas, he says, no, I'm too old, I don't want to leave Troy, I'll stay here and die. Aeneas, showing of course his, uh, his piety, that, that word often translated as, as pious or piety, says, well, if you're going to stay and die, I'm going to stay and die. And then you have um, Sishura, the um, um, Creusa, the wife of, of, uh, of Aeneas, who will in fact mirror that moment um, from the Iliad when she holds, uh, when Andr Andromache holds up Isthanix and says, um, you know, if you're not gonna, if you're not gonna not, you know, go, if you're not gonna avoid dying for me, at least do it for your son. And that's what she does. She holds up um, Ascanius, and then you have this really interesting moment that. St. Augustine and Christian readers of the Aeneid um, to, to follow had to grapple with, you have, a, you have a, a moment when there's a tongue of fire that appears above the head of Ascanius, the son of Aeneas. And this immediately Anchises references as the, so, the omen of all omen. This is a good sign. Of course, St. Augustine, knowing well this poem, raised on this poem, he tells us in Confessions, and many, many Christian readers to follow. They're aware of the Acts 2 verse 3 passage where, guess what? Tongues of fire appear as an important sign over the heads of the apostles, especially Peter. So there's this interesting moment in the poem when everything seems to like be, okay, okay, this is, um, this, this is what has to happen. We then will have Anchises being carried by Aeneas over his shoulder to walk out of the city and he will be holding the hand of the son uh, of, of, his, of his boy, Ascanius, as, he is, as he's leaving. Scholars have pointed out, and we'll say it in our study as well, that iconically, this is a beautiful moment. Um, he will tell um, Creusa, his wife, to follow far behind, 
and no big shock here, Creusa gets, uh, she, she gets lost and ultimately she dies. Remember that Aeneas is telling the story to Dido, right? And yet I think there's elements of the story that Dido would maybe be pleased with in regards to the way that Aeneas then will go back into the city looking for Creusa. He'll see her ghost there and her ghost will say, you have to leave, you have to go found a city on the Tiber, you have to marry a princess. By the way, Aeneas is telling all of this to Dido. So Dido can't be too awfully shocked when Aeneas says finally I've got to leave and yet that's exactly what happens. Of course the symbolism will come back to think of it as he leaves his sacred precious city of Troy in ruins, in flames. Over his shoulder he's carrying his past that he can carry. The, the gods are being carried of uh, the old man um, and Chises is carrying the household gods. We'll have more to say about that. He's holding the hand of his young son, that is to say, the future. You know, he's leading the young boy, um, right, um, Ascanius, out of the city. And the things that he, from his past, he can't carry with him, he can't take with him, like his wife, uh, Creusa, he leaves her, he leaves her behind. They all meet outside of the city, and we're told at the end of book two, like exiles, off they are led to the hills. Any kind of exile literature, will always, it seems, want to find its way back to book two and, of course, book three. In some ways, you can think about Odysseus as exiled on the island of Calypso, but he's trying to get back home. For Aeneas, he's leaving his home for the last time, and it's in complete disarray. We'll ask maybe about some of the texts that we're familiar with that play that same game of leaving and never coming back. Um, uh, we'll, we'll maybe even want to think about you know, in the book of Psalms 137, that famous, by the waters of Babylon, there I sat down. That idea that in exile, all you can do is mourn because you can't sing because your city is no more. Well, we'll, we'll look at, look, we'll look at uh, the lines. I, I wish, guys, I could just read this in its entirety to you. It's such compelling poetry. We'll read a few lines. Let's go to work with it. The opening lines. Dido was asked... Aeneas to tell his story. We're told. Silence. All fell hushed, their eyes fixed on Aeneas now as the founder of his people, high on a seat of honor, set out on his story. Sorrow, he says. Unspeakable sorrow, my queen. Sounding in some ways very much like Odysseus when he will, will tell his story to the Phaeacians. And yet, Odysseus will begin by telling the Phaeacians that he's the most famous guy in the world. Aeneas will begin by telling him that he's the most tragic guy in the world because he watched his city get destroyed, right? You ask me to bring to life once more how the Greeks uprooted Troy and all her power, a kingdom mourned for forever. What horrors I saw, a tragedy where I played a leading role myself. The fact that the word horror gets used here in Fagel's translation later at 3a, you can jot this down, when we meet Joseph Conrad in his classic Heart of Darkness, the last words of Kurtz will be the horror, the horror. And in some ways, Conrad already may be predicting the fall of a certain understanding of civilization's penultimate goals in Heart of Darkness. I think very much an allusion or a reference back to these opening lines of the Aeneid. Notice he says, I played a, re a leading role myself in all of this. But if you long so deeply, a few lines later, to know where we, what we went through, to hear in brief the last great agony of Troy, must, as I shudder at the memory of it all, I shrank back in grief. I'll try to tell it now. He says at line 17, Ground down by the war and driven back by fate, the Greek captains had watched the years slip by until, helped by Minerva's superhuman skill, Athena, right? They built that mammoth horse, immense as a mountain, lining its ribs with ship timbers hewn from pine, an offering to secure safe passage home, or so they pretend. And the story spreads through Troy, but they pick by lot the best, most able-bodied men and stealthily lock them into the horse's dark flanks, till the vast hold of the monster's womb is packed with soldiers' bristling weapons. Now, I think what Virgil wants us to do is to remember that Odysseus and his homecoming, he played a kind of spy surreptitious role with Athena's help. In some ways, that notion of disguise to get inside so that you can jack, very much I think Virgil is playing along these same lines, and here we are. We're told then that 
um, the Greeks will sail away to Tendoros so that they can't be seen. And Troy, he says, breathes free, relieved of her endless sorrow. We fling open the gates and stream out, elated to see the Greeks abandoned camp, the deserted beachhead. And they begin to look at all the different places. There's where Achilles was. There's where, um, you know, uh, Ulysses was camped and that kind of thing. We're told that they're wonderstruck, especially because they're transfixed by the horse, a looming mass, and he says it, our doom. Uh, we then will have immediately the debate. And the, it, again, we're back to this whole question in the Odyssey of Scylla and Charybdis and the, 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 the choice of the modern, postmodern individual. What to do with this horse? I mean, on the one hand, do you just immediately destroy it, or do you try and figure out what it's all about? And we're told then that at, at line um, 55 or so, down Lycaon comes from the heights in full fury, calling out from a distance, he says it, doomed, poor, doomed fools, have you gone mad, you Trojans? You really believe the enemy sailed away? Or any gift of the Greeks is free of guile. Is that how well you know, Ulysses? Trust me, Odysseus, right? Trust me. Either the Greeks are hiding, shut inside those beams, or the horse is a battle engine geared to breach our walls, spy on our homes, come down on our city, overwhelm us, or some other deceptions lurking deep inside it. I'll pause for a moment before I get to Lacan's most famous lines about Greeks bearing gifts. But think about this. Why is it? You, um, you've sometimes even asked this question in 303 about movies. Why is it that any time we have a film where we have some kind of invader from outer space, we always have two clear debates, lines of debate. One is they're here to destroy us. The other is they're here to find out stuff about us, and we should be open and welcome and inviting them in. Why is that debate so acute? Because of, of course, these lines that Lycaon is speaking right now. He says, Trojans, never trust that horse. Whatever it is, I fear the Greeks, especially bearing gifts, line 61, 62. The, the idea then is even more uh, powerful because he throws a spear into the side of the horse and the sound tells them that clearly it's hollow. And yet, we're told suddenly a stranger shows up. And we're told at line 84, now hear the treachery of the